we should have a few I don't know I think we're gonna have a, a few newcomers okay. not a few not not a whole lot be back Okay, my love, this is my last call. They're coming. Janet is here. Yeah, stay awake, my love. Okay, bye. Did you uh, did you print your outlines, Jeanette? No, I haven't done that, but I will do that. Mm -hmm, good. Yes, um, I'm going to print all of them now on because usually I just put them on the side. I have a big screen, so I put them on the left side, and I watch you on the right side, mm -hmm. and that's good. But then when our computer crashed, then we lost some stuff. So yeah, yeah. that's the hard drive that crashed. Yeah, it, was, it died. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, was, yeah. it was unretrievable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. But, we had, um, you know, my husband's good at backing things up. So we had a Turo, Turo drive, which is a lot of the, like, the photos and things, they were put onto that. So. Yeah, it, good. It's retrievable, yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah, I'm not a big fan, but what can we do? This is the age we live in. <laughs> this is the age that we live in. You're right. Apart from this, yeah, it's a good thing that we have it in a sense. So, oh yes, I think another reason I didn't put it, I was going to ask you, because I did Revelation with you before and I still have that outline. Is that going to be about this? Yeah, should be. Is it, the, is it the 16th page? Yeah, it's quite thick, yeah. Yeah, sure, this is it, yeah. yeah I'm going to go slower for sure, but it's the same teaching, yeah. Where is everybody at 5245? Five five? Yeah, this is it. There you go. This is it. Sorry, I was not I was not looking. That's okay. Yeah, this is it. Yeah. Great. You did it at the uh in the, in the, uh, um, yeah. the uh, Christian school? Yeah. You're right. Mm -hmm. 2019, I guess. Yeah. Mr. Randy, good to see you. Can you hear me well? I can hear you well. Can you hear me? It's crystal clear, brother. C crystal clear. Yeah. Good. Going to wait for Sue some more. I talked to Kenneth was there this morning on class. He's still in Florida. Okay. I think he's coming back uh, Friday, I think, something like this. Yeah. Still in Florida. I hope he's enjoying his vacation, a checkup from the neck up. That's it. Yeah, I think so. Oh, I he said that he has a problem with an ankle. Yeah. Yeah, anyway. He was there this morning. should be joining us too. Yeah, I don't know. It's, uh, I'm going to give grace tonight. I'm going to ask them to, to show up on time. It's 7 your time. It's uh, 57, 6.56 my time. 6.56, yeah, 3.56 here. We're on the same... Uh, Minute time. How's the weather like in as we go? Oh, praise the Lord. Got up to 60 degrees today. I wanted to get the barbecue out. I watched the snow melt. <laughs> oh, yeah, beautiful. Oh, Vicky's coming. Yeah. 
I, um, I posted a picture last week. I posted a picture of a wood, woodchuck on Facebook holding a sign that said, I lied. Oh, okay. <laughs> <With our snow>. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Vicky. Connecting to audio. Did you print your outlines, uh, Randy? Yes, you did. I, yeah, good. I did. They're great. Good. Yeah, going to be yeah, quite the, quite thorough. The chronologic chronolo chronology of eschatology was one, and then the other one is the outline for Revelation. Th that's it. You're right. Part one, yeah, the book of Rev, yeah. Uh, Vicky, um, I just trust that you can hear me. I'm here, got my outlines. Beautiful, okay. perfect. Thank you. Thank you for replying. Just want to make sure that everybody is at, uh, technologically proper. Jeanette, Randy, Vicky, who else is joining usually? I had students from Victoria also sometimes. Not quite sure. I'm going to wait two, three minutes and then we go for it. This week kind of snuck up on me. Maybe it snuck up on other people too. <laughs> yeah. But you did receive emails from Olga, did you? Yeah. yeah, you should, yeah. Yeah, I did receive them. Uh, I received them yesterday, I believe. Yeah. And uh, I'd already on the calendar had a plan for today because I'd forgotten or thought there was next week or something. Mm -hmm. So other people might be in that. <coughs> I quickly just changed my plan. Hello, Krista. Can you hear me well? Beautiful. Thank you. Good to have you, sister. We're going to wait a little bit, Krista. Two more minutes to see if somebody else would join in. I have Motorola Raz. Is it your friend, Randy? Somebody's connecting to audio. That might be your friend, Randy. I don't know. Uh, yeah, that is. That's Rory. Rory? Rory. R-O-R-Y. R-O-I-Y. Okay. Rory. Okay. Uh, nice to meet you, Rory. Uh, my name is Fran. This is him. Yeah, I think oh. so. Uh, nice to meet you, dear brother. I trust that you can hear me well. Can you? Do it like this. Rodney, good to see you, brother. Same pattern as much as you can uh, let me know if you can hear me. That's beautiful. And uh, spell the name, Randy, for me again. It's R-O-R-Y. Rory. Okay. Yeah, Rory, if you can hear me, you're welcome among us. That's good to have you, dear you. So I think it will be somewhat the group for tonight. If you can hear me well, that'd be great. Before I pray, and I will not forget, basically. Uh, just a moment. All right. All of you, um, there is nobody physically present here to, uh, for this program at 4 p.m. in the afternoon. The program is kind of more designed for the East Coast. It's 7 p.m. your time. I just want you to know that there is no people. And um, you won't have to request, if you miss a session, you will not have to request for Olga to send you the link because all of this is Zoom, not Zoom, but YouTube. So if you Google my name, Francois Blouin, on YouTube, all the sessions will be available for you if you want to re-listen to them. They will be YouTube. 
uh, my wife will upload them on the system under Francois Blouin YouTube. I should appear somewhere in, uh, in, the, um, in your computer. I want to welcome all of you after the pause that we have made basically for um, the spring break and so on. I want to welcome all those who are coming back and also Rory, uh, the newcomer from the East Coast as well. So you're more than welcome, brother, to join us. A few words about me. I am Francois, your uh, teacher from the Sword Ministry Society established in British Columbia, Canada. All of you know me except Rory. Uh, we will get to know one another, brother. If you have any questions, as usual, you just um, raise your hand. You need to unmute yourself and ask the question and so on. It's going to be very, very extensive what we do together. Let me say a few words by means of sessions or calendar. I put sessions on the board. Uh, we have one session in, in March right now. We will have five Tuesday afternoons in, uh, in April. There is five Tuesdays in May 4 and in June 5. And this will not stop. We, we will stop only when we are done. So if you need a session in June or five sessions or one more in July, there will be no interruption for this one. So meaning well, I'm not going to see you with prophecies in September. We need to finish it. It's a one-shot deal. It's going to be extensive. Uh, I teach only one hour, 50 minutes, as you can see. But we will do the full-fledged of this. I trust that you have received your outlines. You should have a 16-pager outlines and also a set of charts to print. I don't know how many pages there are for the charts. You can tell me. I have the same one as you on a PowerPoint, though not uh, printed for me. So you should have this in front of you to, to uh, basically to facilitate the study together. Okay, so uh, we can pause to follow the class. We'll do the work of inter introductory material. And the, pa the page that you should have in front of you is something like this. It's page 1 of 16. You might have a covered page to this. This is what sh you should have in front of you. This is a study that comes in after a long uh, period of sessions with the group. We've studied uh, many chapters of the book of Daniel that brought us basically at the time of studying the, the scope of the prophecy. All right. And we did also Matthew chapters 24 and 25, the Olivet Discourse, to learn to know what Christ has to do, has to say basically concerning the end time. I'm going to pray, and then we get into the introduction, capital A, authorship of the book of Revelation, and I'm going to have way more to say than you can think, and we will see how it goes from there. So can I um, delegate the, the prayer to Randy to start with? That would be nice, an opening prayer. Rest my voice a bit, and we will see who will be closing in prayer. Randy. Thank you, Lord. Father, we are uh, just uh, so grateful for you allowing us this time to uh, do a deep dive into the book of Revelations. We thank you for the uh, heart that you've given Francois to lead us through this. We just ask you to open our minds and our hearts to your word, Father, to give us understanding and insight. And uh, we dedicate this time to you and ask for you to bless Francois and his teaching in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Before I start with capital A, I just want to establish the truth with you. I mean the truth, in fact, of honesty, to be honest with you. All right. The study that we will do will go beyond the scope of what we find in the book of Revelation because I will explain later how it works because prophecies, we have a lot in the Old Testament and so on. I will repeat that. I want you to know that I am a dispensationalist, okay? I believe in seven dispensations, seven of them. The emphasis will basically be on number five, six, and seven. Number five was uh, the law. Number six was the dispensation of grace, which, are, which we are in now 
including the church age in the Great Tribulation. And then the last dispensation will be the dispensation of the kingdom or the millennial reign of the Messiah. What you will be receiving is from a dispensationalist standpoint. The teaching will be pre-tribulational. And the teaching will be pre-millennial. I am a pre-tribulationist. And I am a, a pre-millennialist. And if you have a question in your mind, yes, but did you study the other views? The answer to that is yes, I did. Post-mill, mid-tribulation, and so on and so forth, even amillennialism, like covenant theologians such as Alice, Louis Burkhoff, and so on. But these are not the views that I will embrace, so you will be taught from a dispensational standpoint, pre-tribulational standpoint, and premillennialist standpoint. So this is an honesty that needs to be established right away to avoid conflict and to avoid basically contradiction and uh, not being honest in teaching and hiding things and so on. François Blouin, your lecturer right now, has nothing to win and nothing to lose. I studied the scriptures extensively without no pride. Okay, I studied for the last 30 years since salvation and I can see no other way to study books outside of the book of Revelation, all of them, 65 books, as well as the book of Revelation, needs to be approached from a literal standpoint, a dispensationalist standpoint, standing in no need to allegorize things that ought not to be allegorized. Beautiful. God bless you. Make notes, ask questions, uh, accumulate your questions. We begin session number one, capital A, Authorship of the book of Revelation at this point. John the Apostle, John the Apostle is the author of the book of Revelation. It's nothing new unto you. The, the name John in Hebrew is Yoshanan. It's a Hebrew name that means Jehovah is gracious. Yohanan or Yoshanan, you go this way. Oshanan or Yohanan, this is the John. It's the same John that gave you the Gospel of John. This is the same jo John that gave you 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. It's called the Epistles of John, same author. And he is the one that wrote to you the book of Revelation. You can be in your Bible right now in Revelation. Revelation chapter 1 verse 4. John to the seven churches. Revelation chapter 1 verse 9. I, John, your brother and fellow partaker. And you can make an additional note of Revelation chapter 22 verse 8. Again, his name is appear and so on. Yes, when John wrote Revelation, it's very different in style than the Gospel of John. And some have, some have said for that reason that it's maybe not the same John. It is the same John. You cannot endorse the same style when you write an apoc apocalyptic book. Okay, he received vision. It's apocalyptic, so you cannot develop the same style when you write an account of the life of Jesus Christ, being an eyewitness of the issues, developing the main theme in the Gospel of John of the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's ap apocalyptic. That's why the, the style differs and so on. Let's discuss the dates. It was basically written in the 90s, 90 apostrophe S, during the first century. During the first century. The exact year between 85 and 93 maybe cannot be pinpointed accurately. It was written in a time of persecution of the church. Some people go with the emperor, the Roman emperor Nero, 
There was a persecution with Nero burning in Rome in 64 AD. In 64 AD. However, I go with a different view than Nero. I believe that John wrote under the harsh regime or harsh reign of Domi, Domitian, D-O-M-I-T-I-A-N, Domitian. And when you go with Domitian as being the Roman emperor of these years, he reigned between AD 81 and the beginning of the 90s. And his regime goes more in line with the complacency of the beginning of the church age. The church that we will see the churches in chapters 2 and 3. So that he wrote under the harsh regime of Domitian. Most scholar goes with that actually. Modern scholars, they go with this date. It's accepted by most of the expositor. Chuck Ryrie, Chuck Swindoll. Dallas Theological, and so on. And this is the view that I endorse, that it was under the regime of Domi, Domitian. I have more to say about other ship, not directly related, but we are done. You can tick mark other ship and so on. Right now, we get in something a little bit more difficult here that I need to explain to you. Prophecies in the time of our Christianity for the last 2,000 years, if you want to use that expression, has suffered under both its enemies and its friends. I explain to you why. It has suffered under the enemies, basically the unbelievers, that says that this is just a battle between the good and evil. But it has also suffered under the friends of prophecies and so on, Simply because many teachers, many Bible expositors embrace two sets of rules when it comes to prophecies in the end time. Outside prophecies, lots of teachers, not lots nowadays, less and less as we carry on in the church age. They go literal approach of the Bible. They take the Bible literally. But when it comes under the end time and all the stories of the end time of Daniel, Matthew chapter 24 and 25, they undertake a tendency to allegorize the text, to sens sensationalize and also to allegorize the text. And this is what I mean that the book of Revelation or prophecies have suffered under both its foes and its friends because of a lack of consistency in the realm of interpretation of the scriptures. And I need to address this tonight. Okay? That's the downside. Bible expositors often have two sets of rules. That's the reason why it has suffered both at the friends and at the enemies. And that inconsistencies in interpretation of the text led the people to spiritualize the text meaning that there is no millennial, a millennial, the, the, the thousand-year reign of Christ doesn't need to be taken literally. It's because of a faulty exegesis of the text. And to make the, the text basically sens sensationalism, they sens sensationalize the text. The United States is the Babylon, the great. The river is the river in the United States. I say I would not recognize the text at all with these things. So these things has to be dismissed here completely. Here, in our study, I'm going to give you four sets of rules of interpretation. They don't come from me. They come from Dr. David L. Cooper. David L. Cooper. David L. Cooper. Dr. David L. Cooper with his set of books, Biblical Research Society. It's taken from there. That's what I endorse. And I'm going to be explaining to you different sets of rules before we get into the book. Beloved, now we see. Tonight, we will not touch the, uh, Revelation at all. Barely. Okay? I want the study to be complete. 
I have one student on the, on the, on the screen right now, Janet, and perhaps also Krista, who did it in the past with me. There is nothing new. I did not change the style apart from adding information around and trying to slow down the pace. So I pray that 10 years ago, basically, I was teaching Revelation. You will receive the same. And I don't want to be shakable in my approach of the text that if I teach it again in 10 years, it has to be the same. I don't want to spiritualize the text nor come up with allegory. Under capital B, everything that I say right now, it's under capital B following on your outlines. The first rule is the rule, the first rule of interpretation here is rule number one. I read the slide because I know that you cannot see it. It says this, when the plain sense of scriptures make sense, make common sense, then seek no other sense. Therefore, Take every word at its primary, ordinary, usual, literal meaning, unless the facts of the immediate context studied in light of related passages and axiomatic and fundamental truths indicate clearly otherwise. In other words, you take the word primary, context, Unless the text is asking you not to take it literally, and it does happen. It has to be correlated in light of related passages. The axiomatic, which, the axiomatic, which is, means obvious, the obviousness of the text. Fundamental truths, like the second return of the Messiah. If it clearly indicate, indicate not to take it literally, you go with that. I'm still on the point one. Yes, if you ask the question, the, the book of Revelation in the Bible has symbols. Yes, it does. There are symbols in Genesis, symbols throughout, packed in the book of Revelation. Are they explainable? Yes, they are. When you violate that rule, they are not. But when you stay within the context, they can be explained. So the book of Revelation with me will be approached as being understandable in the masses. If you study and read the Old Testament and read your New Testament, once you have studied the 65 books that comes before Revelation, Revelation is not the most difficult book to teach. Fasten your seatbelt if one day we do Job. It's quite a bit of a different ballpark than Revelation. Like any other book here, it is understandable. It's been given from above. These are the word of God given to John. And it's meant to be understood. There is nothing difficult in the book of Revelation. I'm sorry to be dogmatic like this. There is nothing difficult. Once kept in context with Old Testament knowledge, plain sense. The second statement that I would like to make under the golden rule of interpretation, if it is applied consistently, that first rule, if you want me to read it again, I will. You can rewatch if you want. Error such as millennialism will be avoided. Okay? Because amillennialism is an error, it's a false view of the book. When it is applied consistently, that when the plain sense of Scripture makes common sense, then seek no other sense. Therefore, take every word at its primary, ordinary, usual, literal meaning, unless the facts of the immediate context, studied in light of related passages and fundamental truths, indicates clearly otherwise. So when that first rule is respected, you do not fall into the trap of allegorizing the kingdom, which is, for me, unacceptable. A little bit more complicated. How are you doing? I know that this is what you were expecting. Maybe not for Rory. I don't know, Rory. You're welcome. Stay with us if you can. But I know that you were expecting details about it. And that's what I am giving you right now. Jeanette, don't forget so to allegor unmute. Allegorizing would mean like... Uh making it be like a story or that's a story? it an allegory a picture of something 
You know, those who allegorize the messianic kingdom that they say Christ is already sitting in his kingdom in heaven. This is all a heavenly thing. They don't believe in the literal approach that he's coming back at the second coming to sit on the Davidic throne. He's sitting on the throne right now, but not on the throne of David. Okay. So they allegorize the kingship as having already received the kingdom. No thanks. That doesn't work consistently with the word. Are you okay with that, Jeanette? Randy. Uh, amillennialism, what is that very quickly? It's ah, anything that is anesthe anesthesia, it's without consciousness. Amillennial or amillennial, it's no millennial. Everything in Latin that starts with the word a dash something, asymptomism, meaning that you don't feel the symptoms on something. Amillennial, it's allegorizing the thousand year. A or a. A millennial, a millennial. Okay? Are you ready to move on into the second rule? This is the second rule under capital B. is the law of double reference. The law of double reference. What is the law of double reference? Write down law of double reference. This is a passage or a block of scripture when it is speaking of two different persons, two different persons or two different events that are separated by a long period of time. I repeat, this is a passage or a block of scriptures like Gog and Magog in Ezekiel that is speaking of either or, or two different persons or two different events that are separated by a long period of time. I have an example of this. Please, you turn with me in the book of Zechariah, chapter 9. Come with me in Zechariah, chapter 9. Go back to Matthews, Matthew. You will see Malachi and go back to Zechariah, chapter 9. I'm giving you right now what I'm doing with you right now. It's to give you two examples of the law of double reference. We need to, because these laws will be applied into the book of Revelation. Come with me in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. You know these things already. As soon as I will start reading, you will know he is into the triumphal entry. It says this in verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the fall of a donkey. Verse 10. I will cut off the chariot of Ephraim, and the horse from Jerusalem and the bow of war will be cut off. And he will speak peace to nations, and his dominion will be from sea to sea, and from the river to the ends of the earth. There is no gap. There is no gap between Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, and chapter, uh, chapter 9, verse 10. Chapter 9, verse 9 is already fulfilled when he first come. Entered into the triumphal, triumphal entry in Jerusalem, wept over the city. You have that in Luke, Mark, and, and an account and, and John's account, but Zechariah chapter 9, verse 10, we're still awaiting for the fulfillment. Are you ready to take a ticket to fly to Israel today? Are you going to fly into a country of peace? Is the Christ ruling all over the planet right now? Is it an absolute monarchy as we speak? So verse 10, there is a gap of time, and that's the law of double reference. Two different person, in that case, it's two different event. It's the same Christ. It's the events that are not the same, separated by a very long period of time, thousands of years in that case. When you study this and you have the law of double wrath in mind, you don't sweat it. Because when Zechariah got it, he has no gap. He doesn't, doesn't have a gap. He received what he what he's received as a prophet, he writes it down and he does not say to Francois, when you pause, this is the first coming and this will be the second coming. No, it's progressive revelation. Come with me in Isaiah 11. 
one more, and we quit that uh, reference, but not right away. You come in Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 to 5. Easy. There is nothing complicated there at all. At all. Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Let's read verses 1 and 2. Then a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse, and a branch from his root will bear fruit. The spirit of Jehovah will rest on him, spirit of wisdom, understanding, counsel, strength, spirit of knowledge, the spirit of the fear of the Lord. Slash forward. First coming. When he first come here, he is the stem of Jesse. Why Jesse? Because Jesse is the dad of David. And he came for the first coming when the Davidic dynasty was reduced to a dead stump, a cutted tree. The Davidic dynasty, when Christ came, was at its lowest peak. It was not within the splendor of David. That's why I say I root, uh, use Jesse in a humble state. How about three to four, three to five? And he will delight in the fear of the Lord, and he will not judge by what his eyes sees, nor make a decision by what he hears. But with righteousness, he will judge the poor and decide with fairness for the afflicted of the earth. And he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Also righteousness will be the belt about his loins, and faithfulness the belt about his waist. When? You got it. Second coming of the Messiah. Many prophetic passages follow that principle. The principle of double reference. Now a word of warning here to all. We need to be careful not to take the law of double reference and to switch it to double fulfillment. The lecturer of that study here does not believe in double fulfillment, so you avoid pitfall of teaching that can be not right. So there is a clear-cut difference between the law of double reference and the law of double fulfillment. I'm still under capital B. I do not endorse the law of double fulfillment. How does it work, double fulfillment? They take a prophecy that is near and far, and they view it as if it would have been fulfilled twice. They take an event that is near, and they take another event that is far. Let's think about the virgin birth. And they say that it was fulfilled twice. Make a note. That's what the people say for the book of Isaiah, chapter 7, verse 14. Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14 reads as follow. And I'm talking right now about the law of double fulfillment. Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14, you know this. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. But there is a child in the context because there will be the promise of a child to Ahaz also and so on. When you read the text in Hebrew of Isaiah, chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, the pronouns are plurals. In the Hebrew text, the pronouns are plurals. And in verses 13 and 14, the promise of the virgin birth is not made to Ahaz, it's made to the house of David. So basically in the time of Isaiah, it was impossible to get away with the house of David since the Messiah did not come yet. So any conspiracy to get away with the house of David was doomed to failure. But in verses 15 to 17 of the same chapter, the addressee there is not the house of David, but Ahaz. And most likely the reference of the child that is in the context goes back to verse 3, in the person and in the childhood of Yesher Yashuv. Yesher Yashuv, a remnant, has been saved. 
So double reference, two persons separated by a, per a long period of time, it falls onto the law of double reference, not double fulfillment. Because if you do the double fulfillment, you basically say that there is no passage talking about the virgin birth in the Old Testament, and this is a dangerous place to go. Because that's why some teacher, they use that passage to doubt, to make the people doubt, was she really a virgin? It goes from there. For those who endorse double fulfillment here, you basically kill the beautifulness of the prophecy of the virgin birth. Because you cannot use the passage to make your point. Unless you read the original autograph, realize that verses 13 and 14, the pronouns are plural, a promise to the house of David, and then you switch to Ahaz for a child in his own days, which is most likely Yeshir Yeshu. I'm done with this. That was the second law. So it's way safer to go with the law of double reference when you have a person, different person, and different events here. In that case, it's different persons. The house of David and Ahaz. Randy. Uh, real quickly, what was your uh, chapter reference in Hebrews for the law of double, double fulfillment? It was Isaiah chapter 7, verses 14. Right, and then you said Hebrews. No, in the, in the original language, in Hebrew, oh, okay. because Isaiah was written in Hebrew. I'm not talking about the book of Hebrews here. Okay. I'm talking about the original, the pronouns in the original. I asked my wife to read it. She reads the text in Hebrew, and the pronouns are plural for verses 13 and 14, and then 15 to 17, it's a singular pronouns. Let's talk about the third law that is important for prophecy. It's the law of recurrence. The law of recurrence, something that recur. How does it work for this one? It's one block of scriptures dealing with an event. Then you're given a second block of scriptures dealing with the same event at the same period of time, but giving you more details to what transpires in the course of the event. I repeat. What's the law of recurrence? To recur, to repeat the same thing. You take one block of scripture dealing with an event. Let's think creation for now. And then you have a second block of scriptures dealing with the same creation here at the same period of time, in the time of Genesis, but giving us more details about what happened during that event. Okay, you can take Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, down to chapter 2, verse 3. You have the law of recurrence right there. You take Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, straight down to Genesis chapter 2, verse 3, and you compare this passage, 1, 1 to 2, 3, with Genesis chapter 2, verses 4 to 25. Because the Genesis chapter 2, verses 4 to 25 is the second passage recurring, offering you more details about the Genesis 1 1. In the course of that study, we will come to Ezekiel chapter 38. Ezekiel chapter 38, verse 1, to Ezekiel chapter 39, verse 16. What is that? You know, this is. The invasion of Israel from the north. You know this. The invasion of the north from Russia. How does it work? You have Genesis chapter, not Genesis, but Ezekiel chapter 38 verse 1 to 39, 16. And then you have Ezekiel chapter 39 verses 1 to 16, talking about the same thing, adding more details. That's the law of recurrence. Those who like Isaiah, chapter 30, chapters 30 and 31 talks about the fall of Judah because they make an alliance with Egypt. Chapters 30 gives you an amount of detail, 31 gives you more detail. It falls into the third rule, the law of recurrence. Does it make sense? I remember when I was at Capenry. Uh, uh, years ago, in 1996, 97, 
I was an older student at Cape Henry Harbor Bible Center, and somebody challenged me with the creation, and I was confused because, say, you have two sets of creation, and this came before that, and, and I was all confused. I was all confused for years until I studied it. Ah, that's the law of recurrence, where the author sat down, Moses wrote the Pentateuch. Okay, I'm starting something here about the same event, simply providing for you more details, which is the creation of Adam and Eve. then it makes sense and you avoid pitfall of allegorizing, thinking double, fulfillment, and all that kind of stuff. And this law will apply to Revelation. Make a note of this. Make a note of what I say because it's ab about the book of Rev. Here. Make a note of what I say. We'll repeat everything twice here. In Revelation chapter 6 to 16, in the book of Revelation chapter 6 to 16, you will have details about the events of the tribulation in chapter 6 to 16. Then, in chapter 17 of the book of Revelation, you will obtain more information about the first half of the Great Trip. In chapter 17, if I'm not mistaken, 17 follows 16, the author, Revelation, will give you more information about the GT, the Great Tribulation. He will give you more, give us more, about the first half. What will he do in chapter 18? Finish the sentence. He will provide you more details about the GT concerning the second half. That's the law of recurrence. We have four, we, we need to take the number four. This one is big enough, I think, for you to, reel, uh, to, to read. R rule number four, that's the law of the context. I can be a little bit kind of sometimes dogmatic with this because I always say to some student, cap A, context, B, context, and C, context, context. Because a text apart from its context becomes a pretext. Would you kindly, patiently, and I, I hope lovingly, come with me in Zechariah chapter 13, verse 6. Come with me. Will you get into the book of Revelation one day? I promise, in 10 weeks. I'm joking. Come. Come with me. Je Zechariah chapter 13, verse 6. Lots of people, they use the Bible and they say to you, you can prove anything with the Bible. Yes, it's true. You can prove anything with the Bible if you violate the law of the context. Every, anything is provable. When you pull this stuff out of the context, you can prove anything. Zechariah chapter 13, verse 6. Listen to that. And one will say to him, what are these wounds between your arms? And then he will say, those which was I was wounded in the house of my friends. Man, talks about Christ. It's Christology in Zechariah. If it talks about Christ, it labels Christ as being a clear false prophet because they failed to, re to read the text from 1 to 5. Here, it does not think, talk about the Messiah an ounce. It talks about the false prophet in the time of the Messiah. Why some people say that this is an image of Christ? Of course, the language speaks the same. Crucifixion, what are these wounds in the house of my friends type of thing? No. When the text is completely pulled out of context, you do mistakes like this one. And it needs to be avoided in the book of Revelation. Okay, that's why the people say to you in, in small group, well, you can prove anything with the Bible. Yes, you can do it if you violate the law of the context. The new Jews... Replacement theology, transference theology, comes from all kinds of violation of the four rules that I just gave you that it needs to be applied consistently in non-prophetic passage as well as in prophetic passage. And then you will avoid capital mistakes to do, to, to speak to our youngster, a young people. Beloved, I'm going to say something here. And uh, you probably will not like it. 
it's going to be said lovingly. If in the last 10 years or 20 years in your church you have not heard about the book of Revelation, you do have a problem. Period. I will not tell you what is the problem. If they have failed you and keep the people ignorant concerning the end time, keeping the people from developing a thirst for the end time, you do have a problem. It's too late, I said it, and it's recorded. So be it. Capital C, the relationship of the book of Revelation to the rest of scriptures. The revelation of the book of Revelation, the book of John, the last book, to the rest of scriptures, plural. This study will be a complete study of prophecy, not only revelation. Revelation will serve as a base of operation, but it will be read fully, not chronologic, not uh, basically in chronology, uh, chronology of chapters, but more in, in, uh, in chronology of events as much as it is possible to find out. Lots will be studied for the next weeks ahead of us concerning the correlation with the book of Revelation. Like I said to you, our book of Revelation will serve as a base of operation. We will study prophecies, but we will go back to serve as a base of operation. And the primary background in our back burner will be the book of Revelation. Another part of the scriptures will be studied at the appropriate time or place in order of event. It will be studied. I will not let you down. As much as we can give it an order of event, it's impossible to do it 100% though. And I will mention when it's a suggested order of event. Okay? One major point here that we need to see, it's what's new and old in the book of Revelation. What is new? And what is old? in the book of Revelation, Apocalypse, Apocalypse in French. Keep in mind that the book of Revelation has no direct quotations from the OT. It has no direct quotations from the Old Testament, but it has about 550 references back to the OT. It has about 550 references back to the Old Testament. So that's why any teaching of books that I do I always say that if you have the desire to have a, a good grasp on the book of Revelation, you need to study the Old Testament scriptures. But it takes time. It takes a lifetime. Okay? The majority of things in the book of Revelation found into the 21st chapter. The first 20 chapters are somewhat found in the OT. Because the totality of chapters in the book of Revelation is 22. Apart from the church age, per se, which is alluded in the OT by being the, the salvation of the Gentiles, not the church church. But chapters 4 to 20, there is absolutely nothing new in it. It's all Old Testament knowledge. Only chapters 21 and 22 are new things given to John. Only chapters 21 and 22 are new things given to John. So follow me with this here. When you take your Bible that you have in front of you, doesn't matter the translation. Throughout your Bible, you have scattered prophecy. Genesis, Samuel, Deuteronomy, the prophet like unto Moses, Habakkuk, Amos, uh, Isaiah, Zechariah, and so on. What the book of Revelation does 
with all these scattered prophecy given over a period of 1,600 years. What the book of Revelation does, watch my hand here, it takes them all together and gives it a sequence of order. That's what the book of Revelation does from chapters 4 to 20. It takes all these scattered prophecy there and there, the little chunk, Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9 and 10, and slang the revelation seen by John the prophet on the island of Patmos gives it an order of sequence. Because from chapters 4 to chapters 20, it's all Old Testament knowledge. That's explained the terrific value, terrific value of this book. And I don't want you, this is a personal statement, and you, you have the choice to believe it or not. That doesn't make any difference for me. That's my desire in the next few weeks, to take time to explain it as slow as I can be without you falling asleep on your chair. This book has to go out has to be made known to the people. And the first people that needs to hear about it, it's not the unsaved per se, because it takes a maturity to understand this. It's you and I. If it's been neglected, like the question that I ask, I think in love, or avoided for the sake of too hard or too many symbols, it has to be corrected. And together, as brothers and sisters in Christ, we have the opportunity to give it some sense. I will not say to give it the perfect clarity. I would claim too much and it would be sheer pride. But at the end of the session here, in 10, 15 weeks down the road, you will say, hmm, I got a good grasp on it. I kind of like it. I'm not afraid of it anymore. I know where I'm going. I know where I will be. I know what I will see, and I know what I won't see. And if I die physically, I kind of know my destiny. How can you do evangelism proper, capital P, without knowing these things? Are you, are you, are you going to share a gospel telling the people that they can lose their salvation? They have the world has to offer losing everything losing wealth, losing a wife by physical death, or, um, uh, how do we say, that? idolatry, a, a, a fortune that maybe you guys had that all of a sudden you encountered a period of your time where you lost everything. Are we going to offer the people a gospel of the same flavor? He will save you, but he might lose you. Beloved, beloved, The chosen, the elect out there deserve, deserve better than this. They're hopeless. Don't give them a hopeless gospel. A gospel that they will walk their Christian walk by trying to hold it together ain't going to work. None of us is capable of holding it together, including the author here. Not the author, but the facilitator. None of us. I shared things this morning that I won't share tonight. One more point under the book of Revelation that I would like you to note. I'm going to go slow. It's, it's, not, it's not far. It's not long. Sorry, stumbling over my word. Every time that I start a new class, beloved, don't ask me if I'm nervous. I'm shaking right now. Don't know what to expect. I need to try to make a good work of intro introductory material. I'm just sweaty. The Old Testament prophets... They had the binocular. In the time 